All right. Good morning. Good rainy morning, but it's still a good morning. Um, whether you are a visitor today or a regular attender, I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Bristol Hopkins. My husband Dave and I have been worshiping in the auditorium services since they started, and we love it here. We love you. Um, I have worn many hats around here over the years. Um, once I graduated from Central in 2002, yay, um, I came on staff here with Children's Ministry for a couple of years until the birth of our first child. We have four now, and I've played the role of mom since then. Around here, I have uh, been a part of lots of different creative teams. That's sort of where I choose to plug in, um, including worship team. I still go downstairs to children's ministry and tell stories occasionally. I love doing that. And most recently, I did some cleaning out of closets around here. So I can do it all. But this is my first time teaching on Sunday morning. So here we go. Um, this is week 14 in our series in the book of Mark, and we're using this book, Jesus the King by Timothy Keller, to kind of guide us through it. And today we find Jesus and his disciples in an all too familiar place, the upper room. Now, I say all too familiar because the scripture that we're going to read together today is actually the words of institution that we use every time we take the Lord's Supper communion on Sunday morning. So the words can be pretty um, familiar to us. And the story sometimes feels pretty familiar to us. So today I would like to look at it in some new ways. So let's read it together. Um, if you need a Bible, there's a card of them in the back. Feel free to go grab them. Um, I've noticed that when people teach, they bring their Bibles up, so I brought mine up. But it's not the NIV, so I have to get a different Bible to read that. Since that's what you all have. All right, this is Mark 14. We're going to start in verse 12 and read through verse 25. It's on page 1007 in these Bibles from the back. All right. Verse 12, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and by, one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. People of God, this is the word of God. So I started thinking about this beginning part, and it sounded a little bit like what Brad talked to us last week when Jesus sends his disciples into the city to get that to get the colt that he's going to ride in on. I think, I think Brad said it kind of seems like a Jedi mind trick. And I think I've always thought of this part of the story that way too. 
that Jesus sort of had this premonition about a man with a water jug in this upper room and he sent the disciples there. But as I read it more, I think it reads more like Jesus went ahead of them and made arrangements. I think Jesus is planning to host this feast. In fact, this will be the first time in the scripture that Jesus presides over the meal, and it's just him and his disciples. So Jesus is going to throw a party. He sends Peter and John to make all of the customary preparations because this is a super traditional meal. So the Jews, having Passover, he wouldn't need to spell it out for them. They knew what that meant, go make preparations. But as evening falls and they gather in the upper room, Jesus has some surprises coming. It becomes very clear that a feast presided over by Jesus is no traditional event. This host, this king, is about to change everything. So, this customary meal would start with the person who is presiding over it, walking through those in attendance, through the story of the Israelites' captivity and delivery from Egypt. So when the bread was broken, the presider of the meal would say, this is the bread of our affliction that our fathers ate in the wilderness. And likewise, they would take the cup, and they would actually take it four different times, and each of the four times they would be reminded of the promises of God. The four promises were for rescue from Egypt, for freedom from slavery, for redemption by God's divine power, and for renewed relationship with God. So four times they would take it, and those were the four promises. But at Jesus' feast, he takes the bread, and in Luke it tells us, he says, this is my body given for you. And instead of four different cups, he takes one and said, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many. Do you see what he's showing them? All of their prayers from Moses until now are about to be answered. Their prayers for a Messiah that they have been crying out for for hundreds and hundreds of years are about to be answered. But Jesus is saying, it's not going to happen how you think. He had tried to tell them over and over again that he was going to die, but it wasn't sinking in. They had been looking for their Messiah to come and rule and reign politically, like an earthly king, to bring the nation of Israel back to its glory days when King David was on the throne and when they had power and influence. But Jesus is desperately trying to show them in these final hours that this is his feast. This is his banquet. And it's no longer their affliction to remember, but his. That God's promises of rescue and freedom, his promise for redemption and a renewed relationship with God will be fulfilled by the shedding of his blood. The answer to your prayers is coming. It just doesn't look like you think it should. Now, between the scene that we looked at last week, which was Jesus in the temple, and this upper room scene, there are several chapters. And what, what happened in those is that the disciples are watching as both the church and government leaders are trying to trap Jesus. They have listened as Jesus silenced the social and political elite with his answers to their questions about hot-button topics like, Taxes, marriage, which issues or commandments they should be most concerned about. 
The disciples have all been on their guard against them and the ways they are going to try and trap Jesus. But again, Jesus is trying to show them it's not going to happen how you think. And in the upper room, he tells them plainly, it's one of you who's going to betray me. In John's account of this same scene, he writes that Jesus actually sends Judas. He says, do it and get it over with. I'm sure that's not how they thought it would happen. You know the other interesting thing about this part, and really the whole upper room discourse, is that Jesus confidently takes his place as the presider over this banquet, as the king, And even in his betrayal, his power is never diminished. Judas Judas is not allowed to go sneak behind Jesus' back and do what he was going to do. Jesus, in his power, says, go. It's time. But let's rewind a minute, and I want to look at something else that actually both Mark and Matthew leave out of their accounts. It's after Jesus had announced that it was one of the 12 that would betray him, but it's before he sends Judas away. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Judas is still in the upper room at Jesus' banquet table at this time. The disciples are arguing among themselves about who the betrayer might be. And it seems that as they do, they start this heated discussion about who's the greatest among them, who loves Jesus the most, who's given the most for the cause, if you will. And John records for us that it's in the midst of this that Jesus gets up from the table. He takes off his garment and he ties a towel around his waist and he begins to wash their feet. I can imagine that that quieted them down pretty quickly. He says to them in Luke 22, 25, In this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, but among you it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. He's showing them the difference between being at his banquet table and the world's. He's saying, look, these arguments about who's in charge, who makes the rules, and who holds the house majority, those are conversations for the world. Here at my table, it is the one who serves who leads. Again, in this moment, Jesus doesn't give his power over in order to serve, but in his power... And in his assurance of his kingship, he offers himself in service and says, I have done this as an example that you should do as I have done for you. And into what I can only assume is a crazy, confusing conversation, he then shares that authority with them. You want power and position, he says, here, have it, in my kingdom. You have the same power that I have, the power to change the world with radical love. You have seats at my table, but you have to give up your seats at the world's table in order to take your seats here. You have to give out, give up your spot at the tables of worldly kings who are feeding you platefuls of their kind of power and prestige wealth and fame, religiosity and judgment. He's also seeming to say, look at my table. There is room for everyone. Remember, Judas is still there. He's saying, I'm not waiting to see which of you emerges as the most capable. I've chosen each of you. At my table, I want all of your voices. I want all of your passions. I want each of your ideas. In fact, when he gave them the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, he follows it with, 
poured out for many. I like the way my Bible says it. It says, this is my blood that establishes the covenant. He is reiterating what he's been trying to teach them all along. The old covenant, the covenant of circumcision, was only available to a few. But now, this new covenant, it's not just for you, Jewish men. It is for anyone who accepts my blood as atonement for their sin. It is for women. It is for children. It is for Jews and Gentiles. It is for Democrats and Republicans. It is for the black men and the Muslim women. It is for the Latino laborers and the Syrian refugees. There is room for all of you at my table. And in fact, unless you are all there, you will not have a complete picture of my body. If we are only willing to share our table with the white, evangelical, socially elite, we will miss his kingdom. Your prayers are being answered. But it's not going to look like what you think. You know, Jesus knew that it's hard for us to give up our old ways of thinking. And it was true for the disciples too. It's easy for us to fall back into our old patterns of behavior. And so he says over and over again, remember me. Whenever you eat bread or drink something, remember me. Keep what I did and said on your mind as often as you can. He recognized that when you don't have someone right there with you, it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to be distracted by the invitations to those other banquets. Jesus recognized that some of the things that he was saying to his disciples wouldn't make sense to them until after they had seen him crucified and resurrected. And so he kept pleading with them to remember these things I have told you. And then afterwards, when things start making some sense, they say again and again, it's just as Jesus said it would be. You know, there's been a lot of stuff in the news lately. It's kind of hard to remove yourself from it. And it's also hard to make sense of a lot of it. I think it's easy to abandon our seats at Jesus' table of radical love and pull up a chair to the world's table of hate and judgment and fear. And it's hard to sit, sometimes alone, at that banquet table of servant leadership when the feast that they are serving over at the power table looks so delicious. But the reality is that eventually the world's feasts will end. That their tables will be empty and that those who have fought so hard for their spots at those tables will walk away hungry and empty. Jesus has proven that his ways are not our ways. That his thoughts are not our thoughts. That he is indeed answering our prayers. Our prayers for reconciliation. Our prayers for freedom. Our prayers for unity. He is readying us for the revival that we long for, but we have to recognize it might not look like what we think it should. If we choose to sit at his table, we can be sure that there is a seat saved, especially for us. You are invited to his table, everyone. His feast is abundant, more than enough for all of us. 
And when we eat, we will be filled. When we sit together in the freedom of his love and sacrifice, united in our love for him, we will see the fullness of Christ's church. We will be in the midst of the reconciliation that brings revival. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Do you know what revival might look like? It might look like each of us fully accepting our role as ambassadors, clothed with the message and healing ministry of reconciliation. Jesus narrows down all of the law and the prophets into two commandments, love God and love others. He tells his disciples in that upper room that once he's gone, people will know that they are his disciples, not by the positions of power that they hold, not by their religious acts of righteousness, but by the way they love each other. So I'd like us to take a few minutes to reflect on this idea that sometimes God isn't answering our prayers how we would like him to. I know I need to look at the ways that I get a little nervous when I want him to bring his iron fist of judgment and he asks me to extend a gentle hand of mercy. Can we confess together that we often don't want to do the hard work of reconciliation? But we would rather hold white-knuckled to our power and position. Can we repent of the ways that we find it easier to judge than to love? Love.